Well, hello everyone. This is another long overdue video, and this is pertaining to Elon Reeve Musk and Yuval Noah Harari. So just to get straight into this, I'm going to start off with going over Neuralink, which is a huge topic of concern for me, and it should be a major topic of concern for all of you as well. Of course, there's a lot of current events going on that are of probably more imminent concern, but I will do my best to go over and do a deep dive analysis on this first. And of course, new videos will be coming out soon on exactly how we can prepare for all of this and what we can personally do now to slow down their tracks. So a video coming on that soon, since that is the number one question that should be in the minds of everyone and is certainly in the questions and hearts of everyone in the comments section. So Neuralink in short is trying to develop an implant that can connect the human brain to a computer or mobile device via an application. Their system involves inserting micron scale threads into the areas of the brain that control movement, uh, such as the uh, motor cortex, right? The threads contain electrodes that will be able to read areas of the brain that transmit them to a computer. Now, uh, how does Neuralink exactly understand the human brain? Well, quite frankly, they don't know much about it, aside from everything having to do with its physical structuring and how it actually plays a role in our nervous system, autonomic functions, and other functions alike. So, the brain is built on interactions between neurons, 86 billion of which are in our brain. Neurons are connected through synapses, which send signals through axon dendrite connections, right? This is basic neuroscience. Um, I'm going to skip through a lot of this. But essentially, um, what they're trying to do is get these electrodes very much near motor cortex of the brain so that they can be able to control the movements of people through electrical signaling, which will then trigger the uh, synapses for a reaction to occur. Um, so you could uh, trigger someone's ability to move their right arm by stimulating a set of neurons. So how does BMI brain machine interface play into this? Well, this is exactly the sort of technology that Neuralink is foundationed upon, which is something that I went briefly over in a separate video during one of my weekend uh, rant videos and banters. So um, currently, right, um, there is quite an investment going on from many different industries into this technology. Um, a lot of them are facading uh, this development as a way to help people who are disabled so that they are then able to be able to, by remote interface, find a way to be able to move again through stimulating these neurons directly using electrodes, right? So that's what they're facading this as some sort of altruistic mission using neuroprosthetics to help people who are disabled, right? So through a neuroprosthetic, right, I don't have that listed here, but a neuroprosthetic is essentially a prosthetic arm, or usually it's an arm, and it is linked using a brain machine interface based technology to your brain where they hook some electrodes to your brain usually to get your mind to be able to move this piece of machinery that will then be your prosthetic, your arm. So essentially, they believe that this BMI, right, brain machine interface is going to be the next step to the evolution of mankind. So the Neuralink app, which is something that I'll go deeper into in just a second, um, essentially is, of course, a way for them to remotely control people's functions via Bluetooth capability, of course. So, you know, um, it has a lot of applications, and I'm not saying that this can't be used for good things. It absolutely can. But, of course, there's more of an insidious agenda behind it all, right? So what is Neuralink's formula? Essentially, their starting point is to develop the cutting-edge BMIs, right? And then they get that funded, and then they get it innovated, and then they find a way to basically create and manufacture this in a mass scale, right? And once they do that, they can then set off a campaign for mass adoption of the whole entire brain machine interface movement, right? For a 
kind of transhumanist sort of movement that would go on. And then, of course, there would be more of a widespread human artificial intelligence integration, which they will say is a reduced existential risk, which is quite an oxymoron, and an increased chance of a good future. I went ahead and took the liberty to edit their little formula here and cross that out and put in complete control of mankind because that is the ultimate actual goal here. Anyway, uh, this is just some uh, more... <laughs> so here we have DARPA funding Neuralink and BMI technology to create super soldiers or turning soldiers into drones. That's right to be able to remotely control a human being, like a machine, like a droid, like a machine, a robot, right? Um, they want to be able to control our military much like how they control drones. So this sort of next-gen non-surgical neurotechnology, right, is looking to expand BMI into its military technology, and they're looking for able-bodied soldiers to be essentially uh, surgically implanted with these microelectrodes, which would hijack the neural communication of the brain, and of, along with other acoustic signals, and use nanotechnology to essentially enhance the soldier's neurons to be more receptive to a lot of the commands that they would be then interfacing into their brains to be able to control them through remote access. So let's go ahead and take a look at this video. This is Pager. He's a nine-year-old macaque who had a Neuralink placed in each side of his brain about six weeks ago. He's learned to interact with a computer for a tasty banana smoothie delivered through a straw. We can interact with the Neuralinks simply by pairing them to an iPhone just as you might pair your phone to a Bluetooth speaker. The links record from more than 2,000 electrodes implanted in the regions of Page's motor cortex that coordinate hand and arm movements. By recording from many neurons and feeding their activity into a decoder algorithm, we are able to predict Page's intended hand movements in real time. First, we calibrate the decoder by recording neural activity as Pager uses the joystick to move a cursor to targets presented on the screen. As he's playing this game, we are wirelessly streaming, in real time, the firing rates from thousands of neurons to a computer. Using these data, we calibrate the decoder by mathematically modeling the relationship between patterns of neural activity and the different joystick movements they produce. After only a few minutes of calibration, we can use the output from the decoder to move the cursor instead of the joystick. Pages still moves the joystick out of habit, but as you can see, it's unplugged. He's controlling the cursor entirely with decoded neural activity. Our goal is to enable a person with paralysis to use a computer or phone with their brain activity alone. Because they wouldn't be able to move a joystick, they would calibrate the decoder by imagining hand movements to targets. One of the things the Neuralinks allow Pager to do is to play his favorite video game, Pong. To control his paddle on the right side of the screen, Pager simply thinks about moving his hand up or down. We've removed the joystick altogether. Now that he's up to speed, let's increase the difficulty and see how well Pager can play with the Neuralink. As you can see, Pager is amazingly good at mind pong. Rather interesting, wasn't it? Well, let me break it to you right now that as of February 17th, that monkey has been confirmed to be dead. So let's take a look as to what Neuralink, the company, and Mr. Musk has to say about that. The company said that it was achieved after the Neuralink chip fed information from the monkey's neurons into a decoder, which was then used to predict Pager's intended hand movements, just like you saw 
yada 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 and pretty much uh they were investigated uh for basically endangering and violating this uh monkey's welfare and doing egregious experiments on this monkey that led to its death so elon musk company Neuralink, which aims to enable brains to connect and communicate with computers has acknowledged that the monkeys died as a part of its testing procedures but denies allegations of animal cruelty of course in a blog post on its website Neuralink addressed that the recent articles that have raised questions about Neuralink's use of research in animals at the university of california said that all novel medical Devices and treatments must be tested in animals before they can ethically be trialed in human beings. Oh, that makes it a lot better. Macaque monkeys have been used in Neuralink as the company has been developing Bluetooth-enabled implantable chips inserted into the monkey's brain that the company says can communicate with computers via a small receiver. And then, you know, just like how we saw the monkey playing Pong and everything like that, they get into that. And, um... There is an extreme pattern of suffering and staff negligence on the 23 monkeys obtained for these experiments. The committee said that the letter of USDA is based on 600 pages of so what is called being disturbing documents being released after the committee filed an initial public lawsuit in 2021. So that pretty much sells it to you that these individuals are rather immoral and have one agenda set forth and one agenda only. And that's to, at any cost, roll out brain-machine interface to hijack the consciousness of mankind. But it is futile to hijack the consciousness of mankind. These people are fools. And I'm glad that they are fools. We should all be glad that they are fools. Anyway... So, basically, they're saying that this monkey had a surgical complication, right, by an FDA-approved product called BioGlue. And after that, the monkey had to be euthanized, essentially. So, of course, um, there's a lot of more push against, you know, whether whatever was done to the monkey was ethical. And, of course, it wasn't. So anyway, I'm going to skip right over all of this now and go straight into Elon Musk. So what do we know about Elon Musk? I'm not going to get into everything. We all know about SpaceX. We all know about, you know, all of these different companies that he's had. Um, you know, he's developer of X.com and PayPal, Zip2, SpaceX, Tesla, you know, the boring company, Neuralink you know, many, many different platforms that he's opened up um, as well um, to himself. And of course, you know, there's the whole thing regarding his Twitter uh, fiasco, which I believe is just a publicity stunt. All right. But more interestingly, let's look into Mr. Musk's personal life, his dating history. You know, because you really want to see how a person treats other human beings, especially through intimacy, right? You want with your with your significant other. So, you know, his ex-wife, first wife, pretty much said that uh, Elon looked at her pretty much as a starter wife. So, you know, then he moves on to someone younger, of course, and he keeps this going, this cycle and he even dated amber heard that nightmare so right off the right off the rip you can see that there's something not right about him um when it comes to his personal life and him being able to take personal responsibility for himself and a family that's a pretty pretty major red flag right there if you don't have your personal life together and you have this much power in your hands that's not good Moving on um, to Yuval Noah Harari, right? So we went over a little bit about him and this individual and how the whole apex of his research is all about hacking humans, right? It's very similar to Mr. Musk's work. 
And one interesting thing I want to point out is that he is an alumni of a very suspect university, the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, which if you look into the Hebrew University of Jerusalem's history, you'll see that one of the visions of the Zionist movement was the establishment of a Jewish university in the land of Israel. Founding university was proposed as far back as 1884 in a conference of the Zion Society, the first Zionist Congress of 1897. So this university is a cornerstone for Zionists. So that should already ring off a lot of red flags. Yuval Noah Harari has expressed a lot about how he feels about Ukraine and what he thinks about the war. And of course, you see a lot of Israeli interest in the war in Ukraine with the Israeli special forces joining in the ranks of the Ukrainian military, right, with the Azovs. So this is very, very concerning. And of course, uh, there's a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, gut feelings on a lot of people's ends about Zelensky potentially being a Zionist as well. So that is a concern. And it's mostly just given him, it's mostly just his behavior that has struck people as him potentially being a Zionist, someone who is Jewish, but not necessarily a very clean person per se. He's been accused of a lot of prostitution, gambling, and doing a lot of illicit drugs. Um, I don't consider marijuana an illicit drug as listed here in this article, but I think he's doing other things such as some nose candy, right? He's doing blow and he's drinking a crazy amount of alcohol, right? Um, and of course, you We'll see that in a video or so. That's pretty much all I really have to say. Um, the videos will speak for themselves pertaining to Yuval Noah Harari and his agenda with the World Economic Forum and how that ties directly into a lot of the work that Mr. Elon Musk does as well. And just given everything that I've shown you, how out of whack everyone's personal life is, and you know, going back to Yuval Noah Harari, he has a husband. Um, it doesn't, I haven't seen anything stand out on his personal life that is, is screaming of someone who's unstable, but he is a maniac with his ideologies. I mean, the man is, he has a very strong distaste towards humanity, a similar distaste that is shared with Elon Musk. And that is why I personally think they are definitely working together in this whole fiasco that we are seeing unfold today. Historian and author. Yuval Noah Harari. Yuval, welcome. Hello, thank you for inviting me. I want to start from Ukraine itself and it's 42 mm -hmm. million people and it's particular place between the East and, and, the, and the West. What do we need to know about Ukraine to understand this war and what's at stake? The most crucial thing to know is that Ukrainians are not Russians <clears throat> and that Ukraine is an ancient independent nation Ukraine has a history of more than a thousand years. Kyiv was a major metropolis and cultural center when Moscow was not even a village. For most of these thousand years, uh, Kyiv was not ruled by Moscow. They were not part of the same political entity. For President Putin, is whether Ukraine is an independent nation, whether it is a nation at all. He has this fantasy that um, Ukraine isn't a nation, that Ukraine is just a part of Russia, that Ukrainians are Russians. In his fantasy, um, Ukrainians are Russians that want to be back in the fold of Mother Russia, and that the only ones preventing it is a very small gang at the top, which he portrays as Nazis. Even if the president is Jewish, but okay, a, 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 a Nazi Jew. And, um...
вечер всем. 52 день. Что можно сказать? Мы мечтаем. Спортсмены. His belief was, at least, that he just needs to uh, uh, invade, the Lensky will flee, the uh, government will collapse, the army would lay down its arms, and the Ukrainian people would welcome uh, the Russian liberators, throwing flowers on them. And uh, this fantasy has been shattered already. The Lensky hasn't fled, the Ukrainian army is fighting, and the Ukrainian people is not throwing flowers on the Russian tanks, it's throwing Molotov cocktails. <laughs> Let's, let's unpack that and maybe take the different pieces one by one. So Ukraine has a long history of being dominated and occupied. You mentioned the Tsar, but also the Soviet Union, Hitler's armies. Very soon people will walk around with biometric sensors on or even inside their bodies and will allow uh, Google or Facebook or the Chinese government or whoever to constantly monitor what's happening inside my body. The whole idea that humans have, you know, this, they, they have this soul or spirit and they have free will and nobody knows what's happening inside me. So whatever I choose, whether in the election or whether in the supermarket, this is my free will, that's over. We have the technology to hack human beings on a massive scale. New surveillance technologies that are now deployed just to deal with this coronavirus uh, outbreak. When it's over, some governments may say, yes, but there is a second wave of corona coming, so we have to be prepared. And there is Ebola, and there is also regular flu. Why not protect people against that too, with this new surveillance system? So the tendency would be to prolong it uh, indefinitely. Also, it's the moment when surveillance goes really under the skin, Governments are now not, not just interested in where we go and who we meet, but even in what's happening inside our bodies. Just imagine in 20 years when everybody has to wear a biometric bracelet which constantly monitors your blood pressure, your heart rate, your brain activity, 24 hours a day. You listen to a speech on the radio by the great leader and they know what you actually feel. You can clap your hands and smile, but if you're angry, they know you'll be in the gulag tomorrow morning. Don't think that the rich and powerful in places like Davos will be safe. 